Dr. Mount Nebo, thank you for joining us. Uh, please stand and worship with us. Jesus for the cleansing power. Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood in the soul cleansing blood of the blood of the Lamb. Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood? In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb, are you coming spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood? In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb, are you coming spotless? Are they white? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Thank you for joining us. Good to see everybody today. Uh, please bow your heads and pray with us. Uh, Lord, as we come to you today uh, to worship you, just let us uh, have open hearts as we accept your blessings that uh, we, we know that you give to us. And uh, we ask that you help us to really be uh, just active in uh, worshiping you. We thank you for all th the blessings that you give us, and uh, while we uh, may sometimes act in a way that uh, we may not think we deserve it, uh, we thank you that uh, you've given us so many, uh, so many blessings. Uh, we ask your blessings on Mike today as he gives your message, and uh, we ask your blessings that we may have uh, open hearts and open minds that we could take in that message. In your name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Your 
For Children's Church, I welcome you to head on out the back and participate in, in that. There's some uh, uh, neat words in, in that song. I appreciate uh, Will and Samuel leading us in that worship music. One that uh, stuck out to me today that kept being repeated was, uh, Lord, you've been so, so good to us. And uh, just any serious reflection on uh, on your life and on the Lord Jesus Christ, you'd have to say, that's right, that's right. The Lord's been good to us in good times and bad. He's been so good to us. Well, this morning, I just want to encourage you to take a, uh, take in the uh, updates that are in the uh, in the bulletin. Keep up with what's going on. Just point, draw your attention to the fact that uh, May the 9th is Mother's Day, but also be Confirmation Sunday here, something to look forward to. And then uh, on the, the 16th, we'll be uh, recognizing our graduates, too. So I'll be sure and put that on your calendar. Well, I'll invite you now, if you would, to join me in prayer. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, it's, it's uh, absolutely true, the words of that song. You are so, so good, and you've been good to us. You are faithful and true, uh, righteous and holy. Uh, you know, powerful and, 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 uh, and gracious. God, in so many ways, in these ways and more, you've been so, so good to us. And so we uh, honor you and give you praise this morning. We do want to ask for the family of David Durbin that you would uh, comfort and care for them at the loss of David this week. Uh, Darlene washes one of her sons. 
Uh, Lord, will you, will you care for them and may the good news of Jesus, the hope of eternal life in him, uh, you know, be, uh, be heard and taken to heart by all who are near to them. We also want to pray for uh, Katie Wilford, who will be having surgery tomorrow at Cleveland Clinic. Lord, will you uh, even go before her now and use, use that treatment there, use the surgery there as part of your healing touch for her. And, uh, and, and certainly, uh, I know they, they count upon you, uh, both Katie and Dan and, and their families. Look to you, count on you for your healing touch when we pray for them in that regard. We do, Lord, now just pray for the scripture reading this morning. Uh, Lord, help us uh, not, to, not to just look beyond it. But God, help us to enter into the moment of, uh, you know, looking into Scripture with our own hearts and minds, knowing, God, that in, in your word is truth and life. And will you speak that to us today? We pray in the name of Jesus, your Son. Amen. Do you need uh, refreshing? How about that? Do you need it? Wow, I think we always are in, in need of it. Sometimes we're more aware of it than others. And maybe, maybe now, after a year plus of pandemic life, you, uh, you say, yeah, I could, I could use some refreshing. I mean, just the, the uh, isolation of it alone has, has been, uh, you know, left us, uh, you know, feeling that need of, of refreshing. I want to let you know our leadership team, uh, staff and I are working on some strategies to resume um, more discipleship opportunities and ministry opportunities, fellowship opportunities as time goes on. And so we're working on some strategies for that. And uh, here, here are a couple things you can count on. First of all, Sunday school will resume uh, in person June the 6th. And so that's a little over a, a month away, about a month and a half or so. And that'll happen June the 6th. Vacation Bible School will take place um, in uh, face-to-face in July, and some dates will be coming up for that soon as well. But more details will be coming soon regarding worship service protocols as well. Uh, you know, the uh, uh, vaccines are, are available, and there's an abundance of them now. It's kind of neat. I checked the CDC website specifically and logged into Brown County to see where we were at with vaccinations and and persons who 65 years and older uh, as of Tuesday this past week it was reported 52 and a half percent have been fully vaccinated in that age category and across the spectrum uh, 20 I think it's 23 percent have been fully vaccinated as well so folks who want the vaccine are able to to uh, obtain it and, uh, you know, that, that's certainly helping out and giving us a, a degree of, of confidence to move ahead. So good news there. But, hey, the, the, we're still feeling the drain from the isolation and all the attention given to, to COVID uh, during these days. I told people in the first service, if I never see on television somebody else getting a shot, I'd be just fine with that. It seems like in the news every day, have you noticed that? It's got to be, not just vaccinations are up, but it's got to be somebody getting the, the dart in the arm. It's like, really, again and again and again. So, I, you know, it just, it's like, okay, all right, let's, let's, let's focus on some of the, the things that are happening, you know, positive things that are happening, not just vaccines, but some other things as well. I guess that makes a, draws attention to the news story, but you poor folks, anybody that's a little faint of needles or blood, you probably just can't stand to watch it or pass out, either one, as you see that happening. But do you need refreshing? Do you need refreshing? What is it that refreshes you? Think about that for a minute. What is it that refreshes you? And I'll invite some responses. By the way, I welcome those uh, who are uh, listening at our drive-in service in the parking lot and those who are uh, be watching this service online a little bit later on today. And I'll try to repeat your, the answers so that you hear them as well. But share, will you? What is it that refreshes you? Yeah, Janice? Jesus does. Yeah, in what ways? Yeah. 
yeah, good, yeah. Time with the Lord, yeah, you bet. Talking to him, praying, you bet. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? What is it that refreshes you? Uh, yeah, Linda? A walk, yeah. Yeah, you bet. You bet, good. Anybody else? Kind of related to that, one of the things I thought of was, at least at this point in the year, mowing, mowing the grass. Now, ask me about August, I'll probably say, I'm, I'm tired of mowing, but right now, it's being outside and, and mowing, it's like, ah, oh, you know, outside, enjoying this, that kind of thing. Anybody else? What refreshes you? All right, well, maybe you could probably think of different things, and, and it and probably did during when I asked that question, but I wanted to point out that uh, in his second sermon preached after Jesus was raised from the dead, Peter said that the Lord Jesus will send times of refreshing. Now, as we get into this scripture, I want to let you know that, that um, he, was, he was referring to, you know, uh, his, the second coming of Jesus, but also not just that, but even, even now. So I'll ask you to look with me at, at uh, Acts chapter 3, starting at verse 11. I'll read through verse 20, and I'll invite you to follow along. While the man held on to Peter and John, all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade. That was part of the temple in Jerusalem. When Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the God of our fathers has glorified his servant Jesus. You handed him over to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate, though he had decided to let him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life. But God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as all of you can see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that, this, that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, and that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Verse 11 started out by telling us that, that a, a man held on to the... Uh, uh, Apostle Peter and John as they entered into the temple there in Jerusalem. If you uh, look, it refers back to the early part of chapter 3, and if you look at verse 1, it tells us that it actually all, uh, the, the, uh, the, it was 3 o'clock in the afternoon there at the temple at the time of, of prayer. And it was referring to this, this man and something that had happened in his life. He had been crippled from birth. Uh, it was a sad situation, the fact that the man was crippled from birth. Back at that time, you know, there, there uh, you know, were not, you know, wheelchairs and powered wheelchairs and things like that available. There were not uh, very many desk jobs, if you would, if any, available for someone to work and to make a living. If you couldn't work with your hands, you, you, you typically didn't survive well. And so it is a sad situation. And and he probably got around, as I imagined, you know, with not being able to stand, but he probably could kind of drag himself some. And uh, I've, I've seen this with children who were crippled, that they'll just kind of scoot around. Maybe you've seen that too. Maybe a child, before they learned to walk, and when there was still the fear of walking, maybe you saw a child do that. Now imagine a, an adult doing that. That's probably what he did. He couldn't work, and so to survive, he begged for money, at the temple gate every day. People were in and out of the temple at appointed times during the day, and he had friends or family members uh, carry him there to that gate uh, probably every day, but certainly on this particular day, and he was begging for money. Can you imagine how humiliating that was? You know, uh, uh, 
you know, first of all, not to be a, not to be a you know, productive part of society, as most would consider it, and then to, to beg for a living. How many times do you think he said the same thing over and over and over again? One of the things he probably said was, uh, uh, the Old Testament, God said in the Old Testament to his people, listen, give alms to the poor. So can you imagine the man sitting there, alms for the poor, alms for the poor, alms, you know, or, or you know, for the crippled, this crippled man, or how many, how many different ways and how many different times did he say basically the same thing over all those years? Alms, 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 to the point that he was probably almost just, just humming it and, and with his head, he's seated, he's lower than everybody else. To look up at everybody would have, you know, been hard on his neck. And so he's probably just kind of staring at the, the floor and time after time as, as he saw more feet and legs than he did people. Alms for the poor, alms for this crippled man, have mercy, on, you know, all that kind of thing. Can you imagine uh, his, his situation? Well, the people who lived in and around Jerusalem... Uh, knew him to see him. He was there every day. And, but I wonder how many people saw him but didn't see him. You know how it is. Maybe it's that if you're on your way to work in uh, Cincinnati or some other place and, and you pass an intersection and, and someone uh, supposedly homeless is there with a sign asking for, for money and you see them all the time, you, after a while you see them and you don't see them don't you? And maybe that was the case for many people who went into the temple on a regular basis. But Peter and John were some of the people going through the temple gate that day. And they saw the man. Scripture tells us that they, they really saw him, especially on this occasion. Now, I doubt that, that Peter had planned on this, but the Spirit of God must have prompted him to look straight at that crippled man. That's, that's what we just, just read, that he looked straight at the man on this day, probably having compassion on him, no doubt, uh, because of his physical struggles, but even more than that, Peter must have thought on that day what, you know, what could happen in this man's life if he would, were to believe in Jesus. Now get the picture, we're talking only days, maybe a few weeks after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Peter and John and the other uh, apostles had seen Jesus after the resurrection. They're keenly, acutely aware of, the, of the, the person of Jesus Christ as the Son of God, but also of the, of the power of Jesus Christ, the, the Lord of life, as, as this passage even des Peter describes him, the Lord of life. And that day, Peter and John must have looked at that man and thought, what could the Lord of life, Jesus, do for this man? What could he do for him? Prompted by the Spirit, no doubt, uh, Peter uh, says to him those, those words that maybe you've heard before. You know what? I don't have money to give to you. Uh, first of all, he says, look up, at, look up at me, which is interesting. The man that tells us the man was not making eye contact with them. He's down on the floor, on the, on the ground, on the steps, whatever. And, and Peter says, look at us. He no doubt looked up at them. And Peter says, listen, I don't have money to give to you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And then, you know, Peter reaches out his right hand, takes the other man's right hand, and, and in a flash, probably many things are going through this crippled man's mind. It's likely he had heard of Jesus, no doubt about it. Everybody had been buzzing about Jesus and the miracles and his resurrection and all of that. He no doubt heard about Jesus. He no doubt knew other people had been healed by Jesus Christ. He had probably heard Peter and John even teach about Jesus in, in the temple, that Jesus was crucified, but he was raised from, raised, rose from the dead. It must have all raced through this man's mind in an instant. And then Peter took hold of his right hand and helped him up and said, walk. Can you imagine you know, just believing that Jesus could do it the man, you know, had to, in a flash, probably, you know, believe that Jesus could do it, but yet tentative because he'd never stood on his feet before. His feet and ankles were, were crippled. he had never stood on his own before, but Scripture tells us instantly, miraculously, his feet and ankles became strong, and he jumped to his feet, and he began to walk. Then he went into the temple courts 
walking and jumping and, and praising God. And apparently, he wasn't quiet about it. He was making a lot of noise, a commotion, if you would. And, and people, you know, I mean, why not? His life was changed, completely changed by, by the, uh, the, the miracle healing and uh, through faith in Jesus Christ. Physically, he was changed. He could provide for his family. He could resume interaction with people that others had enjoyed, but he could not. He could now get to friends when he wanted to. He could now go places, see things, do things, work, all of that. And then also spiritually, his life was changed. I wonder if it was the first time he went into the temple period, let alone went in on his own. But he was able to go in and worship. And that day he did in a loud voice, you know, praise God. You know, Jesus had, had, had healed him. Now, the crowds came running to Peter and John, as the passage says. News about him and what had just happened spread, maybe like a wave kind of you know, just washed over people, and, and no doubt as they heard it, heads, heads turned that direction, and pretty soon people started running that way to see this crippled man on his feet. I mean, who, who would not want to see that? I mean, it was a, it was a miracle. It was a miracle done uh, in the name of Jesus, but they didn't yet know that at that point, and so their natural question was this, would have been this, what happened? What happened here? They see the man they'd seen for years going in and out of the temple. He was there. They had seen, but now he's, he's walking. What happened? How did this happen? And the focus must have shifted to Peter and John. It's like, these guys did it. These guys here. And Peter saw what was happening, and the, and the crowd probably wanted to slap them on the back and give them credit and, and say, hey, that's amazing. That's, that's fantastic. You know, but Peter... Uh, you know, knew that, you know, his own ability, his own name could not accomplish anything like this. He had no authority, no power to do anything like that. But he also knew that physical healing wasn't the primary reason that Jesus rose from the dead. As, you know, as wonderful as this miracle was, that wasn't the primary reason that Jesus rose from the dead. That's why he didn't say to the crowd, hey, bring all the crippled people to us today. We're here. We'll be here all day. Just bring them on in. He didn't say that, did he? Instead, Peter deflected attention away from himself, and he said these words, why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness we made this man walk? Why do you stare at us? And Peter saw the opportunity God was giving him to tell people about their need. I mean, the need of the crippled man was obvious. It was a physical need. It was, had been obvious to people for a long time, but they weren't aware probably of their own need because they weren't physically crippled, but they needed to believe in the name of Jesus too for a changed life and for times of refreshing. You know, on the outside, the crowd might have seemed fine, but on the inside... They were crippled too. They weren't much different than people today. They were probably crippled by failures and sin and regrets and unbelief and on and on and on. And, you know, just this lack of belief in Jesus, that was certainly something that, um, you know, they, they were, uh, you know, crippled with, this lack of belief in Jesus. By and large, the crowd was crippled by that. And Peter said to the crowd, you know what? God has glorified Jesus, and he did it by raising him from the dead. Uh, however, then he gets real personal with the crowd. He said, however, you know, God glorified Jesus. However, you, you handed him over to be killed. You did. You disowned him before Pilate when Pilate wanted to release him. You disowned the holy and righteous one. You killed the author of life, and then God raised him back to life. Got pretty personal, didn't he? Helped them to see that they needed uh, Jesus, didn't they? They needed to put their faith in him. They were crippled by a lack of faith and in in by their own sin. Uh, but Peter says, listen, we have seen Jesus. He was raised from the dead. We are witnesses. And then he goes on to say, and I quote, and this crippled man you see walking right now walks because he puts his faith in Jesus and is alive today. By the power of his name, this man was healed. 
Verse 17, Peter said to the Jews at the temple that day that they had rejected the Son of God. But he said, you did it in ignorance at that time. They were still guilty, of course, but they had done it out of ignorance. They had rejected him because they had rejected Jesus prior to the resurrection. But now Jesus had been raised from the, from the dead, and uh, they, they knew it at that time. They had heard about it, whether they believed it or not. Jesus was alive. It had happened, and, and the crippled man was healed by the power of Jesus as, as additional proof that Jesus was the Son of God. They were ignorant of that before, but that day they knew better, in other words. And Peter said, repent and turn away from sin. It's part of the, that's, that's the, the meaning of repentance is to turn, to turn away from sin and to turn to God. And Peter said, for you people that maybe haven't thought about yourselves being crippled, Peter says, repent of your sin and turn to God. Turn away from your sin and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. They may be wiped out. That the, the slate of your sins, if there was a dry erase marker board with all your sins listed there, Peter said, through faith in Jesus, they can be wiped out. They can be cleared off the board. So repent and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out and, and that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. The crowd needed the power of Jesus to heal them too. Not, not from paralyzed feet and ankles, but from paralyzed hearts. Are you paralyzed? Are you paralyzed because of, of sin? You know, just, just lost? Lost is, is the term that's used. Lost to the Lord. Um, you know, not in a right relationship with Him. There's sin in your life and you have not believed in Jesus to forgive you of your sin. And so your thoughts about yourself and your thoughts about God are skewed. They're off. Whatever you think about yourself and whatever you think about God, those, those thoughts are wrong. And, and, and maybe you, your thoughts are wrong in this area. Your thoughts are wrong because maybe you're thinking, hey, it's too late for me. It's too late for me. Your heart is, is paralyzed and and hardened. You know, I've been this way too long. Too much water under the bridge. It's too late to change now. You, you, you think it's too late for you. If you think that, you're wrong. Scripture tells us that Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Period. He came to seek and save the lost. And that means He came for everyone. All of us have sinned. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. Jesus came to seek and save the lost, that was his primary mission. That's why God sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to come to earth. He came to seek and save the lost. And if you haven't yet believed in Jesus Christ, you're skewed, and you're thinking the reason you haven't believed in him is because you're thinking it's too late for you, your, your thinking is skewed. You're still lost in your sin. You're paralyzed in your heart. And you need Jesus to wipe out your sins and to heal your heart. Or maybe... You may be paralyzed by your sin and think that you're fine. Maybe you don't think it's too late for you. Maybe you just think you're fine because you are religious. Maybe you've been in church all your life. You're a good person compared to most. Of course, that's not the standard we're supposed to use. Compared to most, you may think you're a good person, because you, you know, but you haven't believed in, in, in Jesus to save you from your sin. You haven't yielded your life to him as Lord, saying, I'm no longer going to live the way I think I need to live. I want to live the way you want me to live, God. I want you to be the Lord of my life. I want you to be the boss of my life. And if you're thinking, if you're, thinking you're fine because you're religious, you're wrong. You know, if you haven't yet yielded your life to Jesus, and this describes you, it could be said that you are religious and yet not ready not ready to welcome Jesus. You know, that was the condition of the Jewish people that heard Peter speak that day. They were not ready to welcome Jesus. The Son of God came, and they were not ready to welcome Him. Instead, the majority said, crucify Him. We don't want Him. Crucify Him. And if you think you're fine 
just because you're religious, you're, you may be religious, but you're not ready to welcome Jesus. You're paralyzed by sin, but you think you're fine, and according to Scripture, you're not. Without a Savior, we're, you're described as dead in your sin, and that's the way all of us are before we believe in Jesus Christ. We're dead in our sin. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, we're told the wages of sin is death. What we earn by our sin, what we earn by sinning against God, by going our own way, is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So, you know, if you've been in church all your life and you think you're fine, you're religious, but you're not ready to welcome Jesus. Elise's grandparents... Um, uh, Grandpa and Grandma Delaney, dear people, I had the privilege of, of meeting as I came into the family. His name was Claire. Her name was Julia. Kind of different name for a guy, but Claire and Julia Delaney, they were, they were dear people. The first time I met them was at Elisa's 18th birthday party. We were just starting to date, and I was invited to her home for birthday celebration. She's one of eight children. And I didn't put together in my head what that day might be like. And so I show up, and six of her brothers and sisters are there with their spouses. Start adding the numbers up. A couple of aunts and uncles, Grandma and Grandpa Delaney, her mom and dad, and, and we were all around one big table. Whew, I felt like crawling under the table. <laughs> But anyhow, it was there that I met Grandma and Grandpa Delaney. We tried to find a picture of them, couldn't, couldn't find one to share with you. But just dear people, just soft-spoken, you know, just hard-working, salt-of-the-earth kind of people. Just, just great, great folks. And I met them there that day. Later, I learned that they, they grew up in a church in Dayton. And they married in that church, that same church. They raised their three children in that same church. They worked tirelessly in that same church. I think Grandpa was probably on every committee that there was in that church. He was a hands-on kind of guy, too. So any project going on, he was right in the middle of all of that. Uh, just, just great folks. But they had not believed in Jesus to save them. And their hearts were still paralyzed, thinking that they were fine. They just had not yet believed in Jesus. All that changed, uh, you know, a few years after I met them, when uh, Elisa's mom and dad, who, uh, you know, came to know Jesus in their early 50s, I believe, later in life as well. They had grown up in church too. They had all thought they were were fine and hadn't, hadn't really believed in the Lord Jesus, you know, to save them. And, and uh, that when they came to know the Lord, they wanted to tell their family about it, especially, you know, Grandma and Grandpa, who also had grown up in church all that time and thought they were fine. And so they, they began to share with uh, Elisa's grandparents. And in their mid-70s, Grandma and Grandpa believed in Jesus Christ as their Savior to save them from their sins and to give them a new life. And they were, uh, they were changed people. But, you know, this may be you thinking you're fine just because you're religious. But that's skewed thinking. Because Scripture says without Jesus, we're lost in our sin. We're paralyzed in our hearts. We need Jesus to wipe out our sins and to to heal your heart. Maybe that's you. You know, it's, you know, hearing that is one thing. Doing something about it is something else. I don't know how many times they had heard that message in church. Maybe they hadn't heard that message in church. That might have been part of the, the issue at that time. But, but if they heard the message, they didn't act on it until in their mid-70s. And I don't want that to be the case for any of you. If you don't yet know Jesus Christ and you're, you're lost in your sin, thinking it's either too late for you or you're thinking you're just fine without 
the Lord Jesus Christ. I encourage you to do something about that and to pray and to talk to him. And I'm going to ask you to bow your heads now. I ask everybody to bow your heads, and I'm going to uh, lead you in a prayer. If this, is, if this is you and you want to do something about it, you want to come to the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in him, I encourage you to pray something like this. Oh God, it's, uh, um, you know, I, I admit that I've sinned and that I've been without you. What scripture often calls lost. I've been without you. Either thinking it was too late for me or thinking that I'm just fine without Jesus. God, forgive me of my sin. And I, had, I uh, believe in, in Jesus that he is your son and that he was raised from the, from the dead and that through believing in him I can find forgiveness that you have for me and a new life that I can, with your power, begin to live a life that pleases you. And so uh, will you uh, forgive me, Lord Jesus, and be the Lord of my life? Amen. Times of refreshing. Scripture says that, that you know, as we... If anybody repents and turns to Jesus, that God will wipe out our sins and bring times of refreshing. Or, or maybe you're paralyzed not because of your sin, but maybe you're paralyzed because of circumstances that are of no fault of your own. That was the case of the, the crippled man, right? Crippled from birth. He, he was paralyzed because uh, physically and and maybe in his heart too, or, or, or I should say physically, that's what I want to focus on here. He was paralyzed physically because of no, you know, no, just by circumstances of no fault of his own. He was born that way. And maybe you're a believer in Jesus Christ. You're a follower of Jesus. You've put your faith in him. You've turned to him to wipe out your sins. And, and, and he's taken care of that. And you're walking in that relationship with him. But circumstances affect, have affected your heart. Circumstances affect our hearts, don't they? They bring about a numbness. And, and maybe you're acutely aware of that, especially this past year, with, with the isolation, with the uncertainty, with the world being turned upside down, so to, so to speak, and you, you know, you, you just, maybe you're feeling kind of a, a numbness as a result of that. Maybe not from your, you know, some kind of physical ailment, but just in your heart, just, you know, the relationship you had with the Lord, the vibrancy that was there before you're sensing that, hey, things aren't what they used to be in my heart. It's just, it's just hard to, to, you know, to uh, be as, as passionate about the Lord and having that, that desire to, to, to really, uh, you know, live for Him like I used to have and that kind of thing. You may be continuing to read Scripture and to pray and all of that, but maybe it just doesn't feel the same. You know, you're, you're continuing to do those things, but yet it's like, what's happened? Something's going on in my heart. I need a refreshing from the Lord. I mean, I, I, I've, I've certainly experienced some of that. Uh, I think the combination of, of um, you know, having COVID and then, then a major surgery and, and that in itself drained me. And then on top of, you know, the isolation that's been a part of this and, and the, all the factors of navigating through these times and that kind of left me numb uh, to an extent where I'm like, Lord, I need, I need you to refresh me. Maybe that's where you're at. You say, Lord, I, I, I need what you promise in Scripture that you would send a refreshing to my faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe a time of refreshing is what you need because of no fault of your, your own. You're a Christian, but you need a refreshing in your faith. And where can we find that refre refreshing if you're a believer in Jesus Christ? When you're drained, where can we find that? First of all, check your relationship with the Lord. Make sure there's no, uh, no sin, unconfessed. Lord, search my heart. Is there anything that I, you want to deal with in my heart that I haven't dealt with yet? Get that right. Have your, make sure your heart's right before God. And then some practical things maybe you've heard before. Maybe you need to rest. Maybe there's rest that's needed. Uh, uh, you know, Linda, maybe it's like you. Uh, exercise is a good thing. Uh, it, during certain parts of the pandemic, 
the refrigerator was too close and the weather was too bad, right? And so lack of exercise was kind of a common thing. And maybe exercise is, is what, you, what you need. Sometimes when we want to refresh and pay attention to those things that God wants us to pay attention to, and He'll refresh us through them. That morning time with the Lord. Spend that first part of the morning, the best part of your day, with Him. Do that. Get into Scripture. Be, be praying. You know, unhurried. Spend that time with Him. That's another way to find the refreshing God has for us. And then lastly, regular time with Christians who are maybe a step ahead of you in their faith. You know, just spend regular time with them, either in a, a study group, maybe online or in, in person, whatever. But that helps us have perspective, doesn't it? That encourages us forward in our faith as we do those kinds of things. And God will use those as part of His refreshing for us. Times of refreshing you and I need are found in the Lord Jesus. That's one way we come alive to Him, isn't it? Through the times of refreshing that He offers us. If you need refreshing, that means something needs to change, right? If you find yourself feeling you need refreshing, something needs to change. So what is it? What is it for you? What needs to change for you? What is it? Ask God to help you to see that. Is it, is it that you're lost in your sin and, and you've, you need the refreshing of the Lord, the wiping out of your sins and the beginning of a relationship with Him? Something needs to change and do something about that as we talked about earlier. Hopefully you prayed that prayer or something like that. Repent and welcome Him into your life. Or maybe your Christian is paralyzed by circumstances kind of numb in your relationship with the Lord to some degree or another. Well, what needs to change? Take those steps to let the Lord Jesus refresh you. Will you pray with me? Oh, Lord, uh, we're always in need of being alive in a relationship with you. And, and, uh, and, and, and certainly, uh, you know, there are we need times of refreshing to help us to come alive to you for the first time or to come alive to you again as we walk in relationship with Jesus Christ. God, will you bring your refreshing uh, to us? Lord, make it clear what those steps are that we need to take to find your refreshing in Jesus Christ and give us the courage to take them. And we'll thank you in his name. Amen. Will you stand please?